Uh, thanks for coming to this Chicago's Best Ideas talk. Um, thrilled, I hope you are, that we can gather in person. Uh, the subject of the talk is common law constitutionalism. I'm Kurt Bradley, by the way. I'm pretty new here. I'll mention that a couple times in my talk. Um, and uh, let me describe a little bit about what I'm going to cover. Uh, I'm going to describe this great idea from Chicago, both its descriptive elements, that is what it tells us about the world, and its normative elements, what it claims about it being good for the world. And I'll actually talk about some critiques that have been made, including from some Chicago faculty of the idea. And time permitting, I'll conclude with a few thoughts about how I think it's a great illustration of some unique aspects of the culture here at this law school. My hope is there will also be a little bit of time for questions at the end. So if I'm talking you have questions, I do hope we can get to those before we're finished. Okay. So when I was just about, maybe just had started academia for about a year, David Strauss on the Chicago faculty, um, here he is, you probably know him, um, he published an article in the Chicago Law Review uh, called Common Law Constitutional Interpretation. And um, he was intervening in a long-standing debate. So I need to briefly describe that debate so you know what he was trying to do. The debate is between, on the one hand, originalism and textualism. Those are somewhat distinct positions, but they've sort of become merged in recent times. And on the other hand, something that's sometimes derisively called living constitutionalism. According to originalism and textualism, uh, which, again, have tended to become one, more of one phenomenon, one theory, judges in a constitutional law case should apply the text of the Constitution, and they should do so based on the meaning that it had when it was adopted. And that seems pretty straightforward. And, the, and one of the major arguments for it is really rests on an idea of authority, that what gives the Constitution authority over us in our legal system is the process of its adoption through state ratifying conventions for the original Constitution, amendment procedures for amendments to the Constitution. And this is typically how we do think of statutes. Uh, we think that as long as they made their way through the legislative process, that process itself is a reason why they're valid law that binds us. You might call this kind of the command theory of the law, that there was this original command, and as long as it meets process requirements, it's binding. But for the Constitution, particularly for the US Constitution, it immediately creates a dilemma. The United States has the oldest written Constitution in the world. And uh, when you think about that, a small group of people long ago, who are not especially represented at all of our pluralistic society today, and of course making decisions under radically different circumstances than the, one, the ones we find, find ourselves in today, and are long gone. And of course, we never voted for them. We never voted for the Constitution that they approved. Um, I'll just, I have these slides. This is the white guys from long ago problem. Uh, these are the ones who are talking and figuring out what should be the law for us. And it creates this problem uh, that we can ask ourselves the question, why should they bind us? Why should those guys, back in 1780s, decide what we should be doing now? And this is famous. I think I have a lovely slide for this one, the dead hand problem. Uh, which is why should they have this control over us uh, given all the changes and the lack of representativeness that they entail. And, and this is not a new issue. Uh, Thomas Jefferson actually had a view that they should not bind us, and he was part of that uh, dead hand phenomenon, but he thought they should not. And he famously, when he was talking to Madison, said, the earth belongs to the living and not to the dead. He didn't think they ought to be able to continue controlling our lives in perpetuity. And if you just pause for a minute, think about how different our country is today than when the original Constitution was adopted in 1788, 1789. Um, I looked at some numbers. The census that was done in 1790 said there were about 3.9 million people in the US. The current one says it's over 330 million, about 100 times, almost 100 times greater. If you look at the economy, the GDP back then, after you adjust it for inflation, it was about 5 billion of today's dollars. It's over $18 trillion today. People obviously moved around society very differently, horses and buggies and the like. We ride in jet planes with masks on nowadays, but we nevertheless, it's very different kind of transport, and we use computers and smartphones. Um, you know, this is the time of the founders, just to give it an illustration, very bucolic, nice. Uh, this is, I found a good shot of Chicago. This is our time. Very different uh, set of circumstances and environment uh, between those two periods of time. 
and why their decisions should control our lives is a serious question that has been with us for a long time. Now, the most obvious response to that would be that the Constitution itself perhaps contemplated it, and it does have a process for being able to be amended, like statutes can be amended or overturned. And that's a response one could make, which is if it's not working, if it's out of date, if it's unrepresentative of our kind of society, change it. And of course, it has been changed from time to time. The problem with that is partly a design problem, which is it's very, very difficult to amend the American Constitution. Um, it takes uh, two-thirds majorities in both the House and the Senate. Think about how hard it is for anything of any kind to go through two-thirds of both chambers and three-fourths of the states as well. And there have been some amendments, but not many in the modern times. And the most important constitutional amendments are really about 150 or more years ago in the wake of the Civil War, quite a long time ago. So that's a problem. Uh, the most fundamental issues of our lives being decided by people too long ago, too unrepresentative, and too hard for us to update the document that they approved, the dead hand problem. But that's just one side of the dilemma, because the other side of the dilemma is who does the updating if it's not through constitutional textual amendments? And it may be that judges do it when they decide constitutional law, but the problem with that is it seems like it gives them too much discretion. If they're not following the original commands, what are they following? Are they just following their own personal political, ideological preferences to make constitutional law and update it for today. And it's particularly problematic since the judges are not elected. We didn't elect them either. Federal judges are appointed, and they're appointed basically for life. And they have the power, ever since Marbury versus Madison, of overturning the choices that Democratic majorities make in Congress, in the executive branch, in the state governments, through the power of judicial review. And they're not even elected. Uh, here's a picture of our current unelected Supreme Court. They're much in the news, of course, lately, for reasons I'll get to in a minute. Uh, and this part of the dilemma is often called in the literature the counter-majoritarian difficulty. Unelected, and then probably pretty unrepresentative, too, uh, justices and a small group of them deciding major questions for us, and we didn't vote for them either. So why is that any, how does that really solve the dead hand problem? It's just a different uh, problem. And the counter-majoritarian difficulty concept, probably most famously associated with the Yale professor, now passed away, uh, in a very, very famous constitutional theory book called The Least Dangerous Branch. And um, Alexander Bickel, writing in the wake of Brown versus Board, and there were tremendous debates after Brown, the desegregation decision about the proper role of the court, particularly in overturning, say, state government decisions and the like. And there were controversies, uh, as there are now about other things. And, it, and the question was raised, why do nine justices get to decide all these questions? Counter and so it's either we take the original commands that at least went through a certain process, but maybe they're way too outdated and not representative, or we take the preferences of nine judges who have their own issues. So whatever its drawbacks, maybe originalism and textualism at least constrain unelected judges. And maybe, and I think that's a part of the appeal. How do we resolve dead hand problem counter-majoritarian difficulty, on the other hand. Major theories have been uh, attempted. If you take a course in constitutional theory, you will go through these uh, theories. Probably the most famous effort before the one I'm about to describe is associated with John Hart Ely from Stanford in a famous book uh, called Democracy and Distrust. And his, he tried to figure this out by saying, well, maybe the court's role, they're not particularly representative, but maybe if they could just intervene to clear the channels of political participation so we can all participate and give our preferences uh, effect through the democratic process. They can clear out obstacles to change, um, have a process-based approach, not imposing their substantive values on the rest of us, but keeping the process as clear as possible so we can express our modern preferences. And they should intervene when there are problems that block that, okay? Representation reinforcing idea of judicial review. I can't go through it here. It would take a whole uh, lecture. But I think it's fair to say it's widely admired, in fact, may be treated as one of the most significant constitutional theories of the 20th century, and widely thought to be unpersuasive, unfortunately. 
Um, you know, that's okay. If, you know, if it's probably, uh, if, I, I bet he felt okay about that uh, summary. Uh, that is uh, hugely influential, um, very widely discussed. But the basic problem is, and you learn it even in the first year, I assume, of law school, you can't neatly disentangle process and substance. They overlap. And when he talked about it being appropriate, for example, to watch out for equal protection problems, which probably the court ought to watch out for, you can see how substance often gets greatly infused in debates about equality, for example. And he, was, he thought that was part of the process itself. And it ends up really getting back to some basic problems that he was not able to resolve. And that's where David Strauss in the 90s is coming in, trying to come up with his own way of resolving the tension between the dead hand problem and the counter-majoritarian difficulty. And he came up with this idea of common law constitutionalism. So here's the basic idea, and then I'll unpack it. The basic idea is that our constitutional law develops in an evolutionary common law way rather than through the application of some original textual commands. We have uh, constitutional precedents. We have traditions. They develop over time. And the subsequent decisions are then made in light of those earlier precedents and traditions, informed along the way by judges taking account of modern conditions, notions of good policy, fairness, but also in light of the past, not made freestanding. And part of that claim is descriptive. His claim was this, if you just take a look, this is how we do constitutional law in the United States. This is how, how it actually works. And second, his claim was normative, that not only is this how we do it, it's good. It allows for the needed innovation and evolution in our constitutional system and avoids the dead hand problem. But it also, he says, restrains judges and addresses the counter-majoritarian difficulty. And he also uh, claims that it provides a better explanation for why the Constitution binds us today than the command theory. It binds us because it has, in effect, evolved and been adopted over and over again by succeeding generations of Americans, all the way up to the present. That it has evolved to take account of the views and changes that have occurred over time. And in a sense, it's a living hand, not a dead hand. It's one that's actually directly connected to us, not something from long ago. So let me unpack that a little bit. Sounds good, right? Uh, that sounds pretty good. Um, but there are two components. The descriptive claim, is this how we really do things? Well, as he points out, I do think he ends up being pretty persuasive on this claim, as I'll explain. If you look at most modern Supreme Court decisions in constitutional law, you find that the emphasis is not on this old text. There may be a passing reference to it. But most of the landmark Supreme Court decisions on constitutional law are organized around precedent and doctrine and policy, not on the constitutional text. And by the way, that's true of liberal decisions and conservative decisions alike. I'll give you a great quote, I think, from his article. The great achievements of American constitutional law today are the product not just of the framers and their generation, but of Marshall and Story, famous Supreme Court justices early on, of the generation that fought the Civil War and initiated Reconstruction, of Brandeis and Holmes, of the New Dale generation, of the Warren Court, and of many others as well. Now, this insight, description, not entirely new, just to be fair about it. Uh, in particular, a Stanford law professor in 1980 had a wide-ranging critique of originalism. And you can see a kind of a similar idea here. If you look at the evolution of doctrines in just about any extensively adjudicated area of constitutional law, originalist sources, like the original command of the text, have played a very small role compared to the elaboration of the court's own precedents. It's rather like having a remote ancestor who came over on the Mayflower. So others had made, this, uh, had made this point as well. But by giving a developed common law account, a theory of our constitutional law as an alternative to originalism, and being willing to defend it on that terms it was new and important uh, in Strauss's article. Let me, I went through a few decisions in preparation for this. Just to, I, I was intuiting that uh, Strauss was correct, but just to take a look. Decisions, I think you'll probably recognize some of these. Brown versus Board, OK? How do they organize their thinking about whether there should be desegregation of the uh, uh, grade schools? They start with their own decisions about what they've already held. Such considerations from their decisions apply with added force 
uh, people in grade and high schools. Okay, just reasoning from precedent. Uh, what about one person, one vote? Famous decision from the 60s in districting. Uh, talk about the Constitution protects a consistent line of decisions by this court is going to make this clear. Okay, this is driving the decision. Well, those are a couple maybe liberal decisions. How about something conservative? Uh, this is a restriction on Congress's commerce power. Can't criminalize possession of firearms near schools. Talked about. They start with very broad Commerce Clause decisions that they had written, and they say if you read them closely, uh, even those decisions imply certain limits, and then they reason accordingly. Uh, another conservative decision, a limiting, uh, disallowing limits on certain expenditures in elections, the court has recognized, starting right off from precedent, and by explicit holdings, the rationale of these precedents. I don't see a lot of command of the text there. It's really reasoning from the way the law is developed through the common law of the Supreme Court. And I'll give you one more, a uh, more liberal decision recently, uh, same-sex couples have a constitutional right to marry. The court has long held a certain right. True, the court said, that's been focused more on opposite sex partners, but we have other instructive precedents that we can draw. And that's how they reason their way. You could find many other decisions like that. That's the descriptive claim of Strauss is making. But even if you leave the decisions for a minute, think about it. The constitutional system we have today, the one you're used to, you just take it for granted, and how different it is from what Thomas Jefferson and Madison would have seen when the US started. I'll just give you a few examples, but they're major ones. Think about the growth of the commerce power through the nationalization of the American economy. The, 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 the founders would have had no notion of the way our economy works and how significant it is. The rise of presidential authority, particularly during the course of the 20th century and two world wars, especially in foreign affairs. They would have had no notion of how powerful the American presidency would have become. The massive growth in federal spending, which we've seen during the pandemic, but we see it all the time, that would have been inconceivable to the founders. And think about how that likely changes the relationship between the national government with all of that fiscal power and the state government. Again, completely uh, unfathomable to the founders. And then, of course, much in the news, the administrative state, which particularly took off during the New Deal, and is a major part of governance in the United States. It's not going away. None of those major changes in the structure of our constitutional law have anything to do with textual amendments to the Constitution. Text stayed the same. And yet our constitutional system radically is different. We just don't have the constitutional system of the founders, but it's not because the text has been amended. So that's the descriptive claim. And I think you can tell, I think it's pretty strong, pretty powerful. Um, now, Strauss goes beyond that, and he says this is a good thing. It's not only true, it's a good thing. And uh, he says it really could navigate the dead hand problem and the counter-majoritarian difficulty and produce, in fact, better decisions over time than abstract reasoning about the text. Now, here I'll mention a, a historic figure. You may or may not have heard of this person so far, but Edmund Burke from the 1700s, Anglo-Irish politician and theorist, famous. Uh, for a variety of things, but one of which uh, things he's famous for is the idea that we should not, he was against the French Revolution for this reason, we should not engage in big revolutions of change. We should give a lot of weight to the evolving traditions that we have come to be a part of. And we should give them a lot of weight. Uh, that they reflect over time a common stock of wisdom. And we should not just be throwing that out. We would be worse off if we did. And Strauss's idea is a bit like that, that part of this evolutionary approach, part of its appeal, is that we benefit from the decisions before us, and we should not throw them out lightly. We benefit from their common stock of wisdom. And if you apply that to legal decisions, uh, judicial decisions, the idea is each one responds to a particular dispute, tries to do its best to resolve it, both based on the legal materials and notions of fairness. And over time, the later decisions, if they take account of those earlier ones, will benefit for that, from that accumulated experiential wisdom. It doesn't mean we automatically accept prior decisions. They might have gotten it wrong. They might have been, the conditions might have changed so much that we shouldn't give them too much weight. It might actually entrench certain kinds of injustices. We know that. But we should give it a lot of weight and not overturn these past traditions without a pretty good sense that they are wrong. And I, there are many settings in which I think all of us kind of get that. Um, I'll just give a personal example. 
I mentioned I'm pretty new here. I just came here really in August, uh, still getting to know the law school. It would not make sense for me, uh, and nor would be well received, by the way, if I came here and said to all my colleagues on the faculty, you know what? Let's abstractly reason about the best possible law school policies and get rid of everything you have right now and just come up with new ideas for everything, how we do uh, this law school. It wouldn't make a lot of sense. It wouldn't be wise. They've, generations of law professors and students and administrators before me have worked through lots of issues at this law school, seen what was working well, what was not working well. Things have evolved accordingly. It would not make sense to just throw it out and start from abstract reasoning about good law school policies. I should give weight the traditions as they've accumulated and benefit from the common stock of wisdom of this school. And that's sort of the idea uh, that Strauss is getting at for this common law evolutionary precedent-based approach to constitutional law and why it might be a good thing to produce better decisions. Now I should note, Strauss says this is a nice way of navigating the dead hand problem, counter-majoritarian difficulty. I'll get to a bit about the restraint point in a minute. but. He has, since that article, come around to thinking he still likes the phrase living constitution, just to be clear. Um, and it sounds better than a dead one, I suppose, anyway. Uh, but this is his book from 2010, a great, concise book. If you haven't read that, sometime in law school you ought to read this book. It's short, which is beautiful, right, if you're busy. But it's also wonderfully written, goes through all of what I'm describing here in terms of the theory and has some other things about constitutional amendments and the like as well. Just a, just a great intervention, uh, and in many ways even uh, easier to kind of fully grasp than, than the law review format. So I really uh, uh, commend this particular book. And he's going to call it the living constitutionalism. He's not going to shy away from that idea, because his claim is, in fact, it is living today, and that's a, that's a strength. OK, so that's the gist of it, the descriptive idea. This is what we do. Whether you like it or not, this is what we do. But more importantly, you ought to like it, because it in fact produces better decisions and it navigates the dead hand problem and the counter-majoritarian difficulty better than other theories. There have been many critiques. I'll give you a couple of this particular claim. Okay? One that I don't think is fatal um, is about the descriptive part, which is, is he really giving enough weight to the text? Is it true that we just have a common law system? What about the fact that we have a written constitution with some amendments? Uh, is he neglecting that too much? Um, and particularly when you, when you would look at our practice, you would note that we never think it's appropriate, basically, for judge to say, you know what, I know it says two senators per state, but that's dumb. Let's just get rid of it. They don't do it. Never. But they do throw out precedent, for better or for worse. They seem to think the text is more sacrosanct than the precedent, even though Strauss's claim it's all one big common law system. And more importantly, Judges just follow the text, even when they don't like it. They don't just disregard it, but they sometimes uh, disregard precedence. So there's something special about the text in the American system, maybe not fully taken account of in Strauss's theory. Now, he anticipated some of that. He said, I realize sometimes we just kind of follow the text. But he said, we do that not because of, we think it's some command we have to follow from 1789. It's because sometimes we just act pragmatically. And realize some things, kind of like, do we drive on the right-hand side of the road, left-hand side of the road, have to be resolved somehow. And even if we might have chosen something else, it's better that they're resolved. We kind of pragmatically use it as a common ground, a focal point of cooperation. And we just follow the text for pragmatic uh, reasons, a practical judgment, that it's better to leave it settled. But he also claimed, you know, the text matters probably most for the least important questions. For the really big questions, we're not really going to go off of the text. I don't think this fully is satisfactory, and other peoples have responded to it accordingly. Some of the things in the text are super important, and it seems settled, uh, including things like how long the president can stay in office, um, electoral college methods of choosing presidents, controversial, how many senators I've already mentioned. Many things are really important in the text, and they seem to be settled by the text. These are not minor issues. And I think one smallish critique of Strauss's theory is it tends to be a little too adjudication focused. It's much of our constitutional law is not necessarily reflected in decisions of the courts. Uh, and there are many issues, in fact, that don't get adjudicated precisely because it looks like the text settles them. Otherwise, they would be adjudicated. And maybe we're not giving enough credit to the text if we just look at the cases. Here, another critique, sort of a little different one, but I bet you can appreciate it, which is if the, if the assumption is that uh, the participants in our system, particularly today, 
kind of tacitly agree, let's not rock the boat too much on some settled questions. Let's not question the text accordingly. We don't want to mess up that system. That requires kind of heroic assumptions about the participants today and their motives and behavior, probably stronger assumptions that we normally would give for many of the participants we see operating today, as well as their ability to cooperate somehow tacitly to never question the text. Why, how are they cooperating? It's very unclear how that would be likely. And then finally, you know, the Supreme Court can be a great focal point, common ground too. It sets down rules. We could then think it better not unsettle the system by questioning precedent. And yet we do. And in fact, it's happening right now. I'll talk about that in Roe versus Wade, maybe affirmative action cases, as you just saw in the news. Um, it looks like we really do treat precedent and the text differently. And Jack Balkan at Yale, for example, wrote a whole book partly about this idea that uh, the common law account's just not giving a fully satisfactory account of our special role of the text. Now, nice thing about being a law professor, you can keep writing, and you can write some other things. And in fact, David Strauss wrote another article in 2015 after this book uh, in the Harvard Law Review, uh, and it's entitled, uh, Does the Constitution Mean What It Says? And it's a bit of an adjustment, uh, updating to his earlier paper. And what he says what, is that we really, okay, we have a hybrid system. It is partly text-based, it is partly common law, but at least for adjudication, it's basically common law. So he's shifting his uh, claim a little bit there. And he also claims quite dramatically that if you do look at adjudication, when the Supreme Court runs into the text, they often, they don't say they're getting rid of the text, but they basically do that. They work around it, they reconstruct the text, they take what could have been clear text and make it unclear to get where they need to go. That the text, even when it seems controlling, isn't, okay? And I'll just give you a couple examples that everybody knows about. The First Amendment to the Constitution says the Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech, et cetera. But it's long been interpreted to mean the executive branch can abridge freedom of speech, and, the, and, and for a long time, states can't either. But they're not mentioned at all in the text. Congress just can't be, how do you interpret the word Congress to include either the executive or the states? You can't, yet it is from the Supreme Court and very well settled. Equal Protection Clause, kind of going the other way, of the 14th Amendment, just refers to the states. And there might be good reasons after the Civil War to try to limit the states' limits on equality, but it's been interpreted to apply to the federal government in the modern era as well. No text, though. Nothing in the 14th Amendment talks about the federal government's obligations, but that's just the settled doctrine. And these are settled. These are not being questioned. And this is, uh, Strauss has many examples like this that the Supreme Court manages to work around, reconstruct the text in practice. And there's a huge, hugely bold claim here, which is it is not that clear text, when it is clear, controls adjudication. Rather, precedent and traditions affect whether the text is clear in the first place. That is, sure, we'll follow clear text, but our precedent and traditions unsettle the clarity, and therefore they're driving the ultimate decisions, not something we call clear text, because there is no such thing as clear text. It is itself contingent. I'll give you a quote that I think is very uh, good on this. We find some way to reconcile with the text, a result that is actually dictated by precedent and policy, instead of following some straightforward readings. In other words, the precedent shaped the text rather than the other way around. Contestable, to be sure. Uh, similar, by the way, I'll just add my slight voice to this as well. I had written with a colleague at Duke, uh, just happened to be coincidentally that same year, a very similar set of ideas in a paper called Constructed Constraint and the Constitutional Text, that the text constrains, but it's constructed by all of these different kinds of things. And if this is true, I'm not gonna defend it here since I have written about it, but it does major damage to textualist theories of constitutional interpretation uh, that talk about restraining judges. And it also undercuts some efforts, including I'll mention another Chicago faculty member, Will Bode and others who have written with him, like Steve Sachs at Harvard, who have now tried to claim that originalism maybe doesn't have to claim the command theory of the law. They acknowledge that might be problematic, given the time uh, that has elapsed. And what they've tried to claim, interestingly, is that in fact, that's kind of a living hand too, that we accept today originalism as our system of constitutional law. If that's true, that would be a nice rebuttal to Strauss. But of course, Strauss's critique 
uh, that I just showed you, is it, if that were true, if Strauss is right, it radically undercuts the claim that originalism is really doing the work as an access, accepted system of law today. It seems more ceremonial and not actually driving uh, the decisions. Um, I leave it to you to think about, but that's kind of the debate and how it's been uh, joined. Um, now, one qualification here. It is not a claim, and Strauss doesn't claim it, that the Supreme Court always approaches this in a common law way. It usually does in the modern era, but you probably can think of counterexamples, one that came to my mind, particularly if, if there's not a lot of precedent in an area of constitutional law and the, and the Supreme Court today gets to it, they might format a decision that looks much more like the command theory textualist decision, and maybe District of Columbia versus Heller, 2008 decision about Second Amendment, uh, right to uh, bear arms, might qualify as that. And the, both the majority and the center are all kind of originalist in their orientation. That's pretty unusual if you look at the decisions. And in any event, I would also note, if you start to look at all, like all the case law, particularly in the lower court since Heller, about your gun rights, it's all common law since then. What does Heller mean? Let's try to figure out what the qualifications with Heller would be. Forget about, it's nothing in the text. It's all now about how to construe the precedent. And so we're back to Strauss's account even there to, to some extent. So that's the descriptive uh, claim. Uh, I think it's pretty strong. I think uh, it matches up pretty well with the experience we have, particularly in adjudication, notwithstanding their critiques. I actually think it would even be stronger if Strauss did more work outside of the courts. He tends to focus mainly on the courts in his writings, and the Supreme Court in particular. But it, at some point, if you start looking, as I have, because I do a lot of work on separation of powers and foreign affairs, the debates about con law in Congress, in the executive branch, at various periods of history, I'm not picking on one versus another, you will find over and over again that the debates that non-judicial actors have about our Constitution tends not to be the command theory of the text. It tends to be about precedent and traditions, both judicial precedent but often non-judicial precedent. How many times have we uh, fought a war this way? How many times has the president acted with or without Congress? Not the original meaning of the Declare War Clause, but much more about what are our precedent traditions with respect to the distribution of authority about who can fight wars on behalf of the United States, just to take an issue that I've written about. And so if you looked at the Office of Legal Counsel and the Justice Department, just take their memos and take a look at them on separation of powers. It's all common law. They, and if you think about it, it makes sense. If you were an advisor to the Justice Department, they want to know whether they can do something in the White House. You try to figure out what your predecessors have done and how Congress responded to that and what prior interpretations have been like. You don't give them a 40-page memo on James Madison. It's not going to be helpful to the President of the United States. They want to know what they can do in light of the traditions of our system. So I think it's actually uh, his uh, theory is enhanced if you leave the courts and add some other perspective. Here's the bigger challenge, the bigger critique, which is true for basically any constitutional theory, I think, which is the normative attractiveness of it and how successful Strauss manages to be in navigating the dead hand problem and the counter-majoritarian difficulty. And I will say I think the problems here have grown. That's my perspective in recent years. With the greater politicization of the appointments process at the Supreme Court, with the recent personnel changes on the court who have particular attitudes about how to approach their task, I think it puts more strain on the normative attractiveness of Strauss's theory, and I'll explain why. So first, how does, he, how does he actually say that this will restrain judges and not just let them do what they want? He says uh, that, in fact, under this common law account, precedent, in the Burkean way, will exercise some force and restraint. Not inevitably, but it'll be given a lot of weight. And that's true if the justices follow that. If they actually follow the Burkean approach, uh, that might mean we wouldn't see a lot of sudden shifts in constitutional law. We'd see some evolution, occasionally maybe a big shift because there's just a major problem or just uh, what we now all regard as a major injustice that needs to be rectified. But in general, it wouldn't matter that a couple of liberals got appointed to the court or a couple of conservatives. We would have a more of an evolutionary approach. But is this, in fact, the attitude of a majority of the Supreme Court today? And if not, uh, what's to restrain them is the question. And of course, this debate is front and center with questions even this term about what will happen to Roe against Wade, which not only is a precedent, 
but one which was reaffirmed by the Supreme Court in a case called Casey. And there's a lot of speculation, reasonably so, that a conservative majority on the court may overturn or at least sharply restrict Roe. And if that's true, is this really a restraint? Uh, these decisions will bind only when they want them to bind, and maybe uh, we don't have, maybe we should just go back to something that can restrain. Now, Roe might not be the best test case, because Strauss does, even in 1996, now he's coming, writing right after Casey, maybe feels kind of reassured, uh, he's a supporter of Roe, but says it's not the best case, because the best cases are decisions where there's been a lot of established acceptance of the decision. Those are the full traditions that merit the most weight, but we know that Roe has been contested from the time it was decided, huge societal divisions over abortion, and he said, you know, the traditionalist justifications are at least a little bit weaker for having to adhere to Roe than some other decisions like Brown or something like that. But even putting Roe aside, there are real questions as to whether uh, stare decisis, uh, the, that kind of set of norms, will really do enough work on the court, particularly today. You know, the justices, I think, who um, probably most accept it, I'll skip a couple of slides here, are probably Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kagan. Uh, if I had to pick out two justices on the court who are probably most committed to this kind of evolutionary, institutionalist, respect for precedent, uh, for the most part, uh, at least, uh, those two justices particularly come to mind. Um, the problem, of course, is that maybe neither one of them is the majority anymore, okay? Not even the chief. Now, I think it's too early to tell, so this is my bottom line. I, when I teach federal courts, I often stop many times in the class to point out uh, areas of federal courts law where it's clear the majority on the Supreme Court, because there's been a change, does not agree with the precedent and yet lets it continue in many, many occasions. Often doesn't let it expand but often uh, lets it continue. It does not sort of rush out to overturn it. Now, a response to me on that, I think, is, yeah, because most of my examples were not from la this last year or last five years. Uh, they were times when we had centrist justices on the court who really cared about this, maybe like Hagan and Roberts do today, but they're not really in the middle anymore. But Lewis Powell, Sandra Day O'Connor, Anthony Kennedy particularly, that's a period of time. We've had a, you know, at least a somewhat conservative court even before now for three decades or so, but they were the center justices during that period of time, and all of them cared about uh, this kind of Burkean uh, fidelity to precedent approach. And th because they were the median justices, uh, they were able to control that and make sure that it happened, at least for the most uh, part. So you might start to think maybe they're, so they're gone, and maybe we don't have that kind of assurance that we have had, even when Strauss wrote his original article. Now, I don't know. It may be, we'll see. We'll, we'll have to come back, maybe have another talk in a few years, and we'll see what we think about that. Um, there are other constraints on the court besides the norm of stare decisis, so even if that's not doing as much work anymore, it might be the popular opinion and public pressure and backlash and concerns about Supreme Court reform that you hear about exercise some amount of constraint as well and help preserve some of this common law kind of approach. We'll see, and I don't know. Um, I will conclude that part by saying, though, that even if they're not constrained, let's suppose you're an originalist and say, you're just not persuading. It's just they're going to ultimately, particularly now, they're just going to decide based on what they think the best constitutional law is. So you really haven't won out over uh, uh, this counter-majoritarian difficulty. Maybe we should just go back to originalism, which at least claims to constrain the judges. And I will say, I'm not sh even if that's true that this doesn't constrain, Strauss may still win because we might still prefer to have nine justices who live today with us in our time, appointed by current elected officials who we did elect, who understand our needs and issues today, at least we hope they do, much better than people 1789. And uh, we, so I just have a slide to illustrate this. Uh, you know, do we really want these guys to decide same-sex marriage? Just a question for you. Should they be the ones deciding from seven, sitting around in 1787 of course, they didn't think about even the possibility that it would be protected by the Constitution. Uh, or should we at least have people who are connected to the way in which we have come to understand equality and other issues in society? It's at least a question. And it may be, without, even without constraint, we'd rather have con law being made by people connected to us in the way that the current court is compared to those people. And I leave it to you to think about that as well. Um, Final critique uh, made by a Chicago 
faculty member who uh, has now left uh, but was here for a number of years to start his career is Adrian Vermeule. Uh, I, have these, I found all these old pictures of Chicago faculty, and you'll see they, they were younger back then. It's just amazing how that works. Um, and he wrote a book uh, really critiquing Strauss. So this is, you know, this is something that happens on the Chicago faculty. People disagree uh, respectfully, law and the limits of reason. And he said, these Burkean analogies don't work for the Supreme Court of the United States. And what Vermeule said is, you know, what, the Strauss's theory is kind of, you know, you heard a talk, I think, in the fall from Professor Levmore about the efficiency of the common law, famously associated with Judge Richard Posner. And um, Strauss is kind of borrowing from some of that. And Vermeule says it's not really the same. Uh, first of all, centrally, in the regular common law, like tort and property and contract, the legislatures, if it looked like things were not working, well, could just override the courts. But not in con law. The courts have the last word. And this is a famous theory. This is another early uh, picture of Judge Posner way back in the day. Uh, uh, obviously a famous judge, but affiliated with the University of Chicago. And uh, he had this idea of the efficiency of the common law. It's been critiqued a lot by the, on its own. That's a different issue. Uh, but the idea is that those regular common law cases over time might weed out the bad decisions, produce more efficient outcomes. Let's assume that's true for the, for the moment. Um, but A, those were subject to correction by the legislature, not true of con law. And second, there was at least the thought that maybe in the regular common law, there's some overlapping consensus, some shared sense of what good decisions are and what bad decisions are. You know, usually some notions of efficiency. And we could tell when things were really being inefficient, and maybe we could stop those decisions. How do we decide, or how does the court decide, whether constitutional law decisions are bad? It's not really about efficiency. And in fact, they're just deeply contested different views about what it means to do good or bad constitutional law. And if you don't have a shared sense, how do you know which ones need to be corrected, which ones need to be preserved? And it's really hard to, to know that the Supreme Court would somehow have any notion they could agree about that sort of thing. What are the good constitutional law decisions? And the other part of Vermeule's critique is, you know, Burke's thinking about society. He's thinking about all of us, the common stock of the popular wisdom. But we're really talking differently about the Supreme Court. First of all, it's only nine people. And they are actually overriding the collective decisions of the people. That's judicial review. And now, there are ways of dealing with it. And Cass Sunstein, you, I'm sure you've heard of him. He was at Chicago. That He made a lot of his early parts of his career uh, here. Here's a very early picture of him at Chicago. You can see the midway in the background. Um, he's now at Harvard as well. But he tried to figure out some ways to deal with this Concern and his main argument, he wrote books about this, is well, the solution is deference, a lot of deference by the courts to majorities and administrative agencies, Chevron in the news, he's a big fan, and minimalism. That is, really having narrow, kind of case by case type adjudications, don't decide too broadly. And that'll match a little bit closer to the common law model. Uh, and he wrote about this in one of his books, Constitution of Many Minds, tried to say Burke does work if you just follow it in this kind of minimalist way, dealing with uh, Vermeule's criticisms. But again, I'm not sure we'll be persuaded. If you think about the Supreme Court's constitutional law decisions, they tend to look often very political, very ideological. A lot of times they're five to four. Um, if they're just ideological or like driven by ideology, it's not clear that's really a common stock of wisdom. It really is just, perhaps, one side strong views about what the Constitution ought to be. And Balkan also made this criticism. Uh, just, this is not a, a wisdom of a bunch of people. This is just a small group of judges at a particular time. And if that's true, it's not clear there's a Burkean argument for deferring to the past decisions of the other nine judges who have met, maybe had very different ideologies than the current uh, judges. And indeed, the traditional common law imagines individual tort cases, individual contract cases, where two parties are fighting it out over a very particular fact pattern. Your first year of law school, those cases. But that's actually not what it looks like in the modern Supreme Court. They understand themselves, and I think we understand them as having this role, as a kind of also of a law proclamation function. They need to give guidance for the country. They only take 60 cases a year. They need to give us the guidance about the Constitution. But that's not experiential wisdom out of a particular fact pattern that gets added up over a chain of many, many decisions and produces wisdom. It's really much more almost a bit like a legislative task that the Supreme Court's undertaking. And that may be good or bad, but it just doesn't look like the traditional common law. 
and the Burkean arguments start to fade. So where do I come out on that? My, my own view is that I think it's hard to make the Burkean arguments for the accumulated wisdom when we start to look at Supreme Court decisions. If we think constitutional law has gotten normatively better over time, and I actually think it has for the most part, that may not be because they defer to the wisdom of their predecessors. It may, in fact, be because the modern judges came out of a more enlightened society than the earlier ones. And I think that's largely what has happened. And if that's true, the progress that's been made is out of the wisdom of the society in which they came out of, and not particularly the nine judges. So, but if that's right, and I, my own view is that's basically right, then we get back to the counter-majoritarian problem. We haven't solved it. Because now we just have nine judges deciding the proper views of social policy in place of those of elected representatives, and something that doesn't happen with the regular common law. And maybe they should just actually be deferring to the society and not having their own uh, views. So those are significant challenges. And just to uh, wrap up with a few uh, thoughts about where, to, where do we come out of there, I don't think this is fatal. But it's a serious challenge. It might even become more of one in the next few years for Strauss's theory. So first of all, there are normative arguments that don't depend on Burke or Posner's efficiency of the common law argument for following precedent. The stare decisis values are things like stability, protection of reliance interests, um, predictability in the law. Those are all virtues you can have even if you don't buy the Burkean story. And I might add, we might need this more than ever right now. Uh, if anything, we need to lower the stakes of these appointments battles on the Supreme Court, uh, of the elections, because you're so worried if you're in one party, if you don't get elected, you can't control the court for a generation. Given how polarized the country is, if we could actually have kind of a faithful adherence to common law constitutionalism, the stakes would go down. They would, less would turn on any individual appointment uh, we wouldn't have radical changes in the court. Exactly the thing Burke would have disliked, radical change. And it might also help preserve the legitimacy of the court as well, so that it's not just seen as an agent, an arm of the latest politics, part of our polarization. So that would be a normatively attractive thing if that were true. Whether, again, the court will do it, they have pressures in all sorts of directions, I don't know, and that's where I think it's unclear. But there are other arguments besides the Burke and, and Posner arguments. And then a second, and here's sort of where I really do come out, uh, and again, you can come out where, wherever you're persuaded. Um, even if you think all of these critiques of common law co constitutionalism are just really severe, it's always as compared to what? Because you have to choose something here. And it may be the case that originalism, its problems may even be worse. That is, we, there's just no perfect solution here. And it may be that either originalism really does constrain in which case, it's way too static for 2022. Or more likely, in my view, it doesn't actually constrain. And Strauss has argued that. In which case, it is basically common law constitutionalism, but much less candid about what the judges are doing, and much less tied to stare decisis. And it loses the virtues. So you may have know this famous uh, quote um, from Winston Churchill. He's, he was commenting on democracy, not common law constitutionalism. But uh, he said, democracy is the worst political system there is, except for all the others that have been tried. Okay? And that may be true of common law constitutionalism as well, that it has serious issues, maybe even more severe ones at the moment. But it may not have a better competitor, because originalism has some serious issues of its own. Two final thoughts, and then I hope, yeah, a few, maybe just a few minutes for questions. Um, two things, I, one thing I really admire about Strauss's uh, approach, even though it has some of these normative uh, gaps or limits. He actually came out with his own theory as a competitor to originalism. Originalism is easy to understand. It's easy to talk about in the media. Just follow the text. It just sounds so clear and easy. And living constitutionalism always sounded, in, before Strauss intervened, as way too fuzzy, indeterminate, discretionary. And he laid out a systematic alternative to originalism as a standalone theory like John Hardili as well, but that's another major intervention. And most critics of originalism have not done that. They've just picked away at originalism because there's many critiques you could make, but they haven't presented their own theory. And Strauss having done so is a major contribution because it obviously exposes them to all the challenges I've described. 
And then, speaking now as a new person to this school, uh, I think it's a great, his theory and what I've just told you about it is a great illustration of this law school's culture. Because as you can tell, I hope, when I mention all these slides of these people when they were younger, uh, that like all of Chicago's best ideas, I bet, and actually basically like all good ideas, that it's not done in isolation. Uh, Strauss's ideas here are developed in relationship to lots of other ideas, including particularly ideas at this law school. Um, and that would be particularly likely here, given the intense and collegial nature of the place. Uh, it was heavily influenced, obviously, by Richard Posner's theory of the efficiency of the common law. Uh, it overlaps heavily with Cass Sunstein's work on Burkeanism and judicial review. It's been critiqued by people like Adrian Vermeule when he was on the faculty uh, here. And I think it's fair to say, and this is what attracted me, and one of the things that attracted me here is there's probably no law school in the country that has that level of engagement and intensity of dialogue. And you can see the, I hope you can see a great idea uh, in this instance that comes out of it. And I think I benefit from it, obviously. I get to hear all of these great ideas and talk about them. And I hope you do, and I think you will benefit from that kind of culture as well. So that's how I conclude. So thank you very much. It's a great question. Uh, some of the decisions that uh, Strauss uh, would most applaud um, are obviously not simply one more step in a presidential line. I think that's part of your question. And sometimes they may actually overturn pretty quickly a precedent that seems unjust. And any theory here that is respectful of pre precedent and yet wants to defend the kind of uh, decisions that the Warren Court decisions and others have to have some theory about it. To make a longish story uh, short, um, Obviously, part of the explanation is that uh, the Burkean wisdom can come out of the societal changes itself, and that those can be somehow incorporated into the new decisions. Most of the decisions we're talking about aren't radical overturning of earlier decisions. I should note that. You mentioned one about um, Lawrence, but that's a little bit unusual in some of the decisions we're talking about. Most of them, the way they talk is that we've set out in the past, in our decisions, certain principles. And then if you think about how those principles interact with modern society and modern understandings, this produces a new decision. And they say in that sense it's evolutionary. But it's not anything like a kind of a mathematical predictability. When is that appropriate to take that next step into something that's clearly new and maybe not intended by the first precedent? Uh, how would you know? And um, I think his main argument would simply be that as part of that process, you have to take account of the decisions that were made before you, but also the limits in the conditions under which they were operating. So if things have substantially changed in society, that's obviously a limit on how much the sco that scope of the decision should control. So it's something along those lines. It's a great question because you know, one critique of Strauss has also been that his project in some ways is kind of like an effort to preserve the Warren Court against possible change. Um, it has to be more than that to be persuasive to the modern uh, court. And my own view is there are lots of other values of being slower and evolutionary. And I think they persuaded conservatives like Chief Justice Roberts. So I think they can persuade people who not, weren't necessarily fans of the Warren Court. It's a good question. The question is, uh, what would change if it were easier to amend the Constitution of the United States? And it, in fact, is the case in many other countries that they have easier amendment procedures than the United States. This may be a serious flaw in the American Constitution, too hard to change. And as I think I said earlier, it's the oldest written constitution in the world. And part of the problem with that is written at a time when this problem would have been less obvious than it would be to people who are drafting constitutions today. What would it look different? It most likely would look different today if we had a, a, let's imagine that it were almost as easy to change the constitution as to change statutes, which is pretty close to what it is in some other countries. Then we might see constitutional law and statutory law look a lot more similar than they currently do. And the argument that you go persuade a majority if you want something, it would um, be a very different kind of constitutional law than we're used to um, in, that, in that particular sense. Or maybe there'd be something slightly harder than getting a statute. The arguments for you should just have to take your case to the amendment process would be significantly stronger. And probably, therefore, the sense that the Supreme Court's going too far in some cases would also be stronger, since they would be bypassing a realistic process. Um, and indeed, maybe some of these big structural changes I mentioned, uh, maybe even the administrative state and other things, would not be 
so contentious today, in a sense, if we had just done them through some kind of an easier amendment process. What's more controversial is most of those changes never went through any formal process of adoption. They were just endorsed by the unelected Supreme Court justices. So it might increase legitimacy, absolutely. This may just be one of the, there are many probable flaws in the Constitution. Well, how could there not be? Uh, whatever you think of the founders, they drafted over a few months in Philadelphia the best they could this document in 1787. And how well could it fit uh, all of the modern challenges that we have today? Probably not perfectly well. And one is the amendment uh, procedures. And some of the um, conservative original scholars have been writing recently like, trying to think creatively how to make amendments easier. Because they, if they, could, they think if they could just persuade people to somehow have a faster amendment process, that would help originalism's case. Because part of the problem here is the dead hand problem. But it hasn't been solved. And I don't think it can be solved without a change to the text, which is part of the problem. And without that, I think we're going to have common law evolution. Um, but a very good question. Are there any other questions about all of this? Of course, I'm happy to hang around afterwards as well. OK? All right. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.